Now it's slightly clear. I had come in uh, March to uh, doing some work in Kaziranga, so I'd come through Guwahati. So you came last March, 20, yeah. 21 March? Okay, March, when yeah, there yeah. were. Okay, okay. So that time that situation small was quite time good. when there were not many cases. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you could Mark, sample? Yeah, yeah. You could Mark take was very good. Yeah. My students were there for uh, February, March, two months. Jan, February. So, the monsoon starts here from uh, middle June. of June. Yeah, because uh, I think monsoon has come to Kerala. It takes about 10, 15 days to reach us. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we're expecting monsoon uh, soon. Yeah, yeah. Here it is delayed for three days. Started from today only. Okay, okay, great. We have a heavy rain now. It's so nice to see Drupazuti Sakya, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Sorry, I was muted. Good afternoon, Sunandan. How are you? I'm fine, sir. How are you doing, sir? Okay. It's been raining cats and dogs in Bombay, but... Uh, yeah, it's really Bombay, I think morning, most of the places were flooded. Hmm. Hmm. My sub, some villages were supposed to come. They were I held see. up on the way to the airport. I see. Okay. 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 Sikhi, sir, where are you now? See, you're settled in Bombay now or in Assam? No, I'm in Pune actually. Uh, oh. I'm at Ayuka right now, but uh, okay. I look after their teaching learning center and national resource center. Okay. But because of the pandemic right now, I met my wife at IIT Bombay and work oh. online from here. Yeah. Hello, Nissan, are you there? Yes, sir. I think we should start the proceedings, 3.30. Really let the people keep on joining, no problem. Hello, trustee members, faculties, my dear students. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. It gives me immense hope and great pleasure to address all of you present at the fifth Chancellor Lecture Series of the by Santander University. Before I take the pleasure of introducing our guest of honor and speaker, please allow me to publicly express my gratitude to Dr. Kumar Ramakrishna, Officer, Senior Fellow. Welcome to the DBT India Alliance, the School Center for Biological Sciences, Data Institute of Fundamental Research, Bangalore, for taking time off from your busy schedule to be the guest speaker. I am very pleased that you accepted our invitation for today's lecture series and agreed to speak on how genomics can help us understand and save biodiversity. And I sincerely hope that your lecture will inspire and motivate the students faculties and researchers of the university to learn and develop new scientific findings, creating sessions and new studies about new research tools and techniques that can be Now I'd like to request Professor Surandar Purvasa in research to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. Kumar Thank you so much, Nishan. Uh, first of all, a warm welcome to everyone to the fifth lecture in our Sanchez lecture series of Assam Mountain University. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, Dr. Umar Ramakrishnan. 
I will try to briefly give a gist of our illustrious career and I'll try to do that in two, three minutes, which is extremely difficult. She's currently a professor of ecology and evolution at the National Center for Biological Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bengaluru. She has been closely associated with Stanford University, first as a postdoctoral fellow, then a visiting associate professor in biology, and finally as a Fulbright fellow at the Center for Human Evolutionary and Computational Genomics. Dr. Ramakrishnan had been a brilliant student all throughout with a BSc degree from Bangalore University, MSc in biotechnology from University of Pune, followed by a PhD from biology in biology from University of California, San Diego, USA. Her research interest is in conservation genetics of endangered species, emerging infectious disease and molecular ecology. And she has over 100 publications in high impact international peer reviewed journals. She has been extremely active in her professional life, apart from uh, being in the content team of co COVID Gyan. She has also successfully set up a pop up COVID 19 testing laboratory with three other faculty members at NCBS in STEM, which has tested around 100,000 samples since April 2020. She is a member of many national and international committees and boards, including Conservation Genetics Specialist Group, International Union for Conservation of Nature, Steering Committee of International Union for Biological Sciences, Working Group on Zoonotic Diseases, International Society for Biogeography, Big Cats Initiative, National Geographic Society, Specialty uh, Chief Editor of Conservation Genomics, Frontiers in Conservation Science, Associate Editor, Proceedings of the Royal Society Conservation Biology and Frontiers in Ecology and Environment. She was also involved in the preparation of documents for the International Whaling Commission regarding the conservation status of Eastern Grey Whales. She is a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy and has numerous awards and recognitions to her credit. I would like to mention just a few uh, the Wellcome Trust DBT Alliance Senior Investigator Award, Parker Gentry Conservation Award, Fulbright Fellow, Bass Fellow, Field Museum of Natural History, Chicago, Wired Innovation Fellow, Inc. Fellow, Outstanding Scientist Award from the Department of Atomic Energy, Senior Research Visiting Fellow, National University of Singapore, Ramanujan Fellowship from DST, Government of India, Kavli Frontiers of Science Fellow from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, Research Fellow, Wildlife Conservation Society India Program. There's many more, but I kept it very short. So Dr. Ramakrishnan will be speaking on using genomics to understand and uh, conserve biodiversity. So uh, we are uh, very keen to hear your lecture, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan. So it's over to you now to deliver the lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks to all the students and everyone for being here. Uh, I'm, I was never a brilliant student uh, and uh, I've just been wandering about uh, most of my life uh, pursuing curiosity. So uh, I think, you know, it's always wonderful to have the opportunity to uh, basically just follow your nose and try to understand things, which is what I've done all my life. And um, I've, I've always, uh, well, not always. I, I, I was, I first visited the Northeast about uh, 11 or 12 years ago. Surprisingly, I'd never been before. Um, and uh, since then, I was uh, very smitten. And I always uh, love uh, working uh, in the Northeast. And I hope that I can continue to do so uh, in the years ahead. So I'm just going to show you a few vignettes of the work I've done and uh, uh, try to communicate more, not the technical details, but um, the essence and the questions that we've tried to address. I'll start uh, my presentation. So thanks again. And uh, I'll just go ahead and start. So um, I work here at the NCBS. And you can see it's a very uh, peaceful, serene um, environment, which encourages uh, a lot of discussion. Uh, you can see there's a whole lot of posters which have been set up. This is taken, I think, a picture during some kind of a meeting that was going on. And this is uh, very lucky 
uh, for me to be associated with TIFR and NCBS, where there's a lot of freedom given for uh, academic activity. I think freedom uh, to explore is, is one of the biggest uh, gifts that we as scientists can have. So what I'll talk about today is three uh, kind of broad themes. I'll talk about uh, conservation genetics or genomics. Uh, why or how do tools like genetics help us to inform uh, conservation uh, biology, especially in the context of tigers and then uh, some other species? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about emerging infectious diseases. This is something which we may not have thought about so much before, but in the last one year, we've been spending a large proportion of our time thinking about these diseases like COVID-19. It is an emerged infectious disease. Uh, and in this context, I'll tell you about some work I've been doing on bats uh, in Nagaland and also some work uh, in the Western Ghats. Uh, and finally, I'll just touch upon uh, a fascination that I had uh, for a while, which uh, I don't work on so much anymore, on biogeography, trying to understand which species are where uh, and why. So, you know, the, the why is, you know, what is really amazing is that despite uh, the CITES or the Convention for Trade, Illegal Trade of Endangered Species, which is basically a law which prevents trade of endangered species, despite species protection, since 1972, uh, most species are under decline. Biodiversity itself is under decline, right? And uh, one of the big reasons for this is habitat fragmentation. So you can see here in this map, uh, basically how fragmented or impacted different places in the world are. And you can see, for example, that many parts of India uh, like, uh, you know, the Tarai and so on are very, very highly impacted, almost the highest impacted and fragmented of any places uh, in the world. Um, if you also look at habitat loss or the loss of natural areas, um, you can see again that India is one place where there's been a huge amount of loss uh, of, of these uh, wildlands or natural habitats. So um, if you think about this in the context of India itself, uh, between 1900 and 2000, this is how India has changed. Uh, in just 100 years, you can see that the green has uh, changed very substantially. Uh, of course, in the Northeast, there still remains quite a lot of habitat uh, to some extent because of uh, low population density in many places. But overall, uh, in, in peninsular India, across India, we have lost a lot of uh, green cover, whether it's forests or grasslands, we've lost a lot of it. And most of, much of what remains is in the form of villages or, you know, degraded habitats. So then um, how does this potentially affect uh, endangered species like tigers? So this is a picture showing you the tiger reserves, which is the kind of allowed habitats for tigers across India. And you can see that they are very small. They are often very far away from each other. Um, and so this is not really a great situation in terms of survival for the tiger. So tigers have already lost 95% of their historic range. Uh, but 60% of the world's tigers live in India. So Whatever tigers remain in the world, 60% of them are shoved into mostly these small, small gray areas. And if tigers are survive anywhere, they will survive in India. So in a sense, it is India's responsibility to the world that tigers must survive. So um, we, we know from uh, studies in ecology uh, that when population sizes are very small, uh, there is a high chance of extinction. There's a high chance that those populations will no longer survive. Um, also, if populations are isolated, they're not connected to each other uh, through movement and movement of genes and individuals, then also the chances of extinction are high. So what we need to understand is we can see the locations of these tiger reserves on a map, 
uh, and we can count the number of tigers in these locations using camera traps. And that information tells us that the median population size in any one of these gray protected areas is about 40 to 50 individuals. So that's very few individuals, right? If there's only 40 to 50 individuals, how will these populations survive on their own? They can't. Uh, they have very high chances of extinction. So the only option is if these populations are connected. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Are they connected? What are the populations? How do we even know this and how do we study it? So one way to study it is to basically uh, follow individuals, see how they are moving with radio collars or something like that. But that's very difficult and it takes very long. How many individuals will you collar? How many will you follow? You have to do it for hundreds and hundreds of individuals. So it will be very tough. Another way to do it is to use genetic variation or genes as a proxy or uh, a way to look for you know, populations that are connected or not connected. So you can imagine that if there are two populations which are connected, then the the genes will be similar in those two because there's been mixing, right? Just like two cans of paint, if you mix them, the color of that mixture of those two paint cans will be similar. But if they are completely separate, the colors would be different. So in the same way, isolated populations would have very distinctive genetic signatures or profiles, whereas connected populations would look similar to each other. So the very simple and basic thing which we can use once we get genetic material from tigers, once we get the DNA and the genetic information of tigers. So the second big question is, how on earth do we do that? You know, all of you have had COVID tests uh, for COVID-19, right? And you stand, sit there while someone, you know, dips this kind of swab into your you know, like into your throat, they scrape some cells, scrape, they're pulling up your cells as well, right? And so when you do a COVID test, actually they look both for the virus, but they also look for human RNA. So only if they have human RNA, they say, okay, uh, this test has worked and there is virus or there is no virus. So similarly, I mean, there's just no way you could imagine how would you get genetic material from a tiger? You're not going to catch a tiger and shove a swab down his throat or inside its mouth. It's just impossible, right? So most of the time, we use non-invasive sources to access genetic information of tigers. We use either fecal samples, which they deposit to mark their territories. They use these as kind of signposts. Uh, or sometimes we use shed hair or saliva, anything which is non-invasive, where we don't have to touch the animal. At times, tigers are caught for various reasons. Maybe they're causing conflict or they die or something like that. And at those times, if possible, we can access some tissue. So uh, what we did, and this study is basically based on tissue because we were able to uh, get samples from several people across labs uh, in different parts of India. And we were able to ask the question, what are the tiger populations? Are all tigers one population in India? Or are some tigers more isolated or connected to each other? Okay, And we did this by using these markers called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. There are many, many millions in the genome. And this is kind of an old study. Since then, we have repeated this with whole tiger genomes. Uh, but overall, the results are similar. So I'll just show you uh, the results from this one. So what we can do is once we get all of this genetic data, we can look at the data and say, OK, how many bins? Suppose I say there are two types of tigers in this data. Which individuals? map to type or population one and which ones map or type map to population or type two. So when you say there are two populations, it's basically uh, southern India, which is a distinctive set of tigers. When you say there are three, it's southern India, Ranthambore, and this large area of 
central India, Tarai, and northeast. And when you have further numbers of populations, the northeast separates out, or the Tarai separates out, and central India separates out. You can visualize this or do this analysis in various ways. And the reason we do this is because each analysis has assumptions. And we want to ensure that our inference or what we uh, interpret is not because of the assumptions of a particular model or a particular analysis type. So for example, here you have a PCA or principal component analysis, which has certain assumptions. This is an assignment test which is based on population genetic assumptions. And this is um, like a dendrogram kind of analysis where you look for clustering and similarity of uh, individuals and so on. So you'll notice, for example, in this dendrogram thingy that tigers from Ranthambore, they have very short, short branches, whereas tigers from central India have long, long branches. And we'll come back to this uh, again. But basically, Yes, it's not that every single tiger population is distinct. Uh, there are tiger landscapes which seem to have genetically connected populations, but there are also isolated populations. Ranthambore is an example. It seems to be an isolated individual population. Okay, uh, We can also look at how much genetic variation these different populations have, and you can just focus on the figure below. So for example, if you look at the central cluster, it, if only the central cluster were to survive, that would represent 92% of all tiger variation in India. So that much of tiger variation is there in that central cluster. And what is more disturbing about the tigers in Ranthambore is not only are they isolated, but when you look at the relatedness between tigers in Ranthambore, the values are quite high. It's almost as if they are, each of them is like a sibling to the other. So this is a population which appears to be isolated and inbred. And we know from uh, genetic studies on flies and rats and so on, that when populations are inbred, again, their chances of extinction are high. And we've done some work which should be coming out soon uh, to look at the effects of inbreeding in Ranthambore. The other thing we're trying to do in Ranthambore is to construct the pedigree. Uh, basically, this is a kind of a crazy project where we follow tigers and they all have some numbers and names because it's easy then for tourists to identify them. Right. So basically, we follow tigers, uh, say we follow, you know, T45, and we look for uh, the hair of that individual. And then we try to reconstruct the relationships of T45 to others in this pedigree. And so far right now, we have sampled about 30 tigers from this entire pedigree. The population is around of size around 60 to 70. So we've got a lot of individuals. And it's a big challenge because no one has really constructed an unknown pedigree like this from a wild population. So it's something we're trying to do because then we can look at inbred individuals versus not so inbred individuals. What is the effect of inbreeding? How does it affect them? And that will get to answering a more basic question as to is inbreeding bad and how does it affect tigers? Because in the future, maybe more populations will become isolated. Uh, another isolated population we've worked on is Simlipal Tiger Reserve. And this is also something which is hopefully going to be published soon. Uh, there are many color variants of tigers that are known. Uh, for example, uh, the white tiger is quite famous. This is just a specific mutation, one spelling change in the DNA, which causes a tiger which is like this to now look like this. Okay, uh, This is also very interesting maybe for you is there's also this other phenotype called a golden tiger. Golden tiger has been sighted in Kaziranga. And in fact, as I was just telling Dr. Talukdar, I was there in uh, Kaziranga in March, uh, where uh, my students were working for about two months, trying to sample fecal samples of tigers from Kaziranga. Since the mutation is known, we can bring these samples back to lab and ask, do we see the golden tiger? Not by seeing it with the binoculars or eyes, but through its genes. Can we, quote unquote, see? the golden tiger is there in 
uh, Kaziranga based on sampling its mutations. But the Simli Pal tiger is very different. Uh, it's got it's like somebody dropped black paint on it. It's a very beautiful animal, and it's a, called a melanistic tiger or a pseudo melanistic tiger. Melanistic would be if it is fully black. So this is not fully black, but quite blackish. And again, this tiger also has been found only in Simli Park. And this was a very complex, like slightly difficult project. Luckily, we wanted to, in this case, the mutation or the genetic basis for this was not known. We were able to identify the mutation which causes you know, this tiger to start looking like, OK? And basically, we were then able to survey how common is the mutation in Simlipal, again, based on fecal samples or poop, tiger poop, looking through Simlipal for two years, collecting tiger poop, bringing it back to the lab, identifying how many tigers and how many tigers with this specific mutation, right? And it turns out that while this mutation is a quite common in Simli Park. 60% is its frequency in Simli Park. It turns out that outside Simli Park, the mutation is absent. We don't see it at all. So this is, again, one of a possible effects of isolation. When you have isolation, by chance, certain mutations or alleles or types of genes can increase in frequency just by chance. Now, whether this is bad or not, we don't know. Is it bad for that this tiger looks like this in terms of for its survival? We don't know the answer to that. That is a difficult question to answer. But at least we suggest, our data suggests that Simlipal is isolated. And we need to work then to connect Simlipal somehow. So for example, if you look at Simlipal, it's not like it's completely, you know, there's no forest at all. By the way, for Rantambo, the problem is the Chambal. The big Chambal River is here. Uh, but you know, here, there's quite a lot of forest in Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, uh, and all. But the connectivity is very poor because uh, there's a lot of hunting in these areas, uh, especially Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and to some extent, Odisha. As a result, the prey is depleted. There's not much of prey. And so tigers are not able to make a home there. They come and they go. They come and leave because none of the habitats or places are good enough for them to stay and have enough food for a long period of time. So as of now, it appears Simlipal is isolated. And somehow, we must work to connect through these stepping stones. There are many populations close by. We need to be able to somehow connect these populations. Otherwise, Simlipal will continue like Ranthambore on its own evolution trajectory. Uh, on its own versus these guys, for example, it looks as if they are connected. So that's kind of the assumption I showed you earlier that this whole stuff is like one population, quote unquote. But how connected are they? And what does this connection depend on? Okay. So that was a study again done by one of my PhD students where she walked for thousands of kilometers through all of these different parks, Kanha, Penj, Bor, uh, Umrain Karela, Tadoba, Tippeshwar, etc., etc., Bandhavgarh, many, many parks. Uh, a lot of fun for her also, but very, very hard work. Uh, you know, with teams of volunteers, up to 50 students, not at any time, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe like three or four people at any given time. So two teams of people walking. Uh, and just to give you a flavor of the field work, you set out and you walk through the forest, maybe 30 kilometers a day. And on the way, whatever fecal samples you collect, you pick it up, you mark it with a GPS location, and you move on. And you keep doing this for months. Uh, and after this, she had collected samples from all of these places. And basically, uh, she investigated, first of all, what are the factors which allow connectivity or movement? And she also did simulations where she said, given what we understand about connectivity, which areas are good for tiger movement and which areas are bad, how does the future look? Okay, So in what are called future scenarios, 
we model different versions of the future. So for example, so just to orient you, these little dots are the protected areas and this is present, okay? And um, you can just look at this, this is extinction, this one, okay? Basically, after 100 years, you can see that if you have unrestricted development, a lot of protected areas have a, a high probability of extinction. The same is true if all of these parks are fenced. So sometimes people suggest, you know, these tigers are moving, they're coming out, they're causing problems. Let's just fence up the protected areas. If you do that, also you'll see very high extinction. But if you have corridors, ability for tigers to move, you'll see that there's very little extinction. And in some sense, this makes sense, right? That's what corridor is supposed to do to prevent extinction, to allow recolonization, to allow populations to persist. But to show this with real data and then simulations was, I think, a very useful thing. So this work and other work which we've done was then used in a, in a, in a court case uh, against the National Highway Authority of India uh, because they were planning to build, uh, expand a highway which was bifurcating over here. And basically, our data suggested that tigers are actually moving uh, you know, between these areas, Kanha and Page, and showing this data uh, proved that by building this highway, they would be disrupted. So there was for while and today uh, that was in 2017 i think something like that and now uh, uh, there and tigers are moved between these protected areas so, so for students especially sometimes you wonder what is the point of this studies it kind of seems a little irrelevant uh, sometimes you know these type of data can actually have impacts on the ground you can actually you know, have something as solid as like a underpass. So that's a real thing, like compared to simulations and all these are all in some sense, you know, they're just in the computer. So, so basically, uh, these are the kind of connectivity maps that we have developed, uh, which show, for example, that roads are high barriers. Uh, they have low connectivity. Uh, as, as do urban centers. And this is where the NH7 uh, uh, was basically, this was the highway, which, which was expanded, uh, but now with an underpass. And so, uh, you know, there continues to be movement. But I just talked about tigers so far, right? There are so many other species which live in this habitat. Uh, leopards, jungle cats, deer of different kinds and so on. What about them? Is it the same kind of, connectivity issues for them. So that's something which, oh yeah, by the way, this is the road network of India. And if you imagine that roads are barriers, and for example, many times wildlife, like this tiger crossing the road was hit by a vehicle. Imagine the amount of wildlife deaths, uh, as well as the barriers. To, imagine like your house, for us a road is a means to get from one place to the other. But for a wild animal, it's a barrier, right? So imagine your land or your space being bifurcated by these roads. Um, it would be really, really difficult, for example, if you lived here. Um, so anyway, so like I was saying, we are looking at different species from a small manjak to a large gore uh, and then jackals and holes and many species and asking, you know, how does roads, how do roads actually impact these different species? in terms of connectivity. And this is some work which is ongoing. We've also, for example, looked at other endangered species like vultures. Uh, we've looked at the fecal material of vultures and tried to identify what they're eating. And this is very important. For example, in Assam, you have the critically endangered slender bill vulture. And basically, uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a dramatic crash in the number of vultures because they were eating um, prey, uh, so they were eating basically cattle, which were uh, had been given diclofenac, which is like a crocin uh, for cattle. Uh, but for some reason, 
this particular drug causes vultures to have immediate uh, renal failure and they just die kidney failure they have as soon as they eat a carcass which has diclofenac they die so obviously today wild vultures are recovering and diclofenac has been banned but they can only recover if people are not still using diclofenac and in general if they are not eating so much of domesticated livestock like cows and all that so we basically developed an approach to understand what are they eating are they mostly eating wild prey because they are not going to be medicated with diclofenac or are they eating cows so this is also something where we can just use a method to understand about species biology especially in the context of species which are very difficult to study so basically just to summarize this part conservation conservation genomics helps us better understand animal distributions and the consequences of development we've already seen that some populations are isolated and this may show some effects and consequences uh, the same corridors while corridors do allow species persistence based on models the same corridors may not suit all species and this is something which needs to be studied further and of course we need to do uh, you know use new methods modeling and exist ex extensive sampling to understand these problems better so now just switching to emerging infectious disease um this is a very scary in some sense map it shows us based on various analyses the predictions of emerging infectious disease risk across the world and while there are some hot spots in africa you can see that all of india and all of south china is has a very high threat or risk of disease emergence um we have all heard about bats and the rna viruses that they carry uh, so i was very keen to investigate more about bats and rna viruses and the best place to look at this of course is areas where bat diversity is very the number of bats is very high uh, the number of species of bats and that is of course northeast india this is just a map showing bat richness across the world and you can see definitely northeast and southeast asia has very high bat diversity and it so happened that uh, a student of mine who's from uh, manipur a uh, pilot he, he heard about this really interesting hunting festival which happens every year in a small village called nimi nimi is at the border with myanmar very very close to the border and what happens here is every year uh, the bomer people get together they smoke and as the bats come out of the cave uh, they they uh, kill them and then they use them because of consumption so you can see here all this are dead bats okay not that's not mud it's dead bats and this is the village people this is the mouth of cave so obviously there is a lot of exposure between bats and people so what we asked was do we see serological evidence of exposure to antibodies in bats and people specifies do we see virus fall catch by bats and the people do we see either exposure to viruses in the people uh, or not i want to really uh, say that this work can be potentially uh, has we have very safe safety measures so this is just to to of my students wearing respirators uh, and doing and then was a lot of work anyway it's is work and the ppe and etc with more into the bird to collect some guano or something like that and so as what you have found this is some of this work is published more of it is to come and i'm sure it's going to be um quite a <laughs> maybe i don't know whether i should say controversial or uh, there's already been some some on this project basically it seems like there are pathogens which are circulating in the bats 
which are consumed by people in the in this part of northeast india we also found uh, three antigenic unique filoviruses a family of virus in both in the bats and two of those same virus antibodies in humans this suggests potential spillover okay that is there's a specific virus the antibodies for that virus which means the person has been infected that's when you have antibodies you all we all know this now uh, because of covid-19 even if you're an engineering student you know what are antibodies now right the bats show three particular viruses ka antibodies and the humans uh, who are hunting or interacting with these bats show two of those three so basically this means that potentially there has been some spillover between the bats and the humans so this is um, suggesting then that this harvest is a very high risk interface and a very good system to study spillover now there's nothing very sensational about this i i i guess the way that we see it is spillover probably happens a lot but maybe in many cases humans are a dead end host that is the spillover happens but the virus is not fit enough in humans to replicate reproduce and grow uh if it happens enough times the virus will be selected and it may there may be mutations in the virus which allow for it to happily reproduce and grow in humans i think that's what we've seen in covid-19 in sars cov2 the virus that causes covid-19 that it spilled over maybe many times we know but at some point it has a ability to enter human cells to produce well and what we saw for is on the second wave is also new waves or further evolution uh, in humans of the virus right so studying these spillover systems and by the way i should say that nobody mimi is sick there's no one who's well nobody is dying nothing right but maybe it's spilling over that is happening which we need to study to be better prepared right that in case there's a successful spillover we know what it might be and how to tackle it okay i think this is a very exciting area of future work and i have actually just submitted a large grant uh, to the department of biotechnology the northeast cell to work with several partner institutions in the northeast to actually uh, study these things uh, across uh, several states in the northeast but we'll see Uh, what happens uh, we have done some similar work on rodents uh, in in the western ghats and this is just to show you again diversity of rodents is quite high in asia and africa uh, and basically here we worked in a fragmented uh, landscape it's a tea plantation called karumane you have many tea plantations in assam as well and these uh, plantations have a lot of different types of habitat they'll have a bit of forest some grassland you know there's some abandoned cardamom plantation all kinds of stuff so basically there'll be labor lines you know built up it's where the labor lines are and all of these different types of habitats will have different types of rodents uh, which are like living very close to each other this kind of a situation then allows again for a high prevalence of potentially pathogenic bacteria so here we didn't look at viruses because with rodents it is bacteria which are more prevalent we looked at a specific potential zoonosis that is bartonella and we found that uh, in some species of rodents bartonella was up to 80% of the rodents so ratus satare which is a rat of the western ghats has 80% of the rats have this bartonella bacteria now whether this all these different bartonellas are pathogenic we don't know we are just looking at their genetic material but it is something again which can be a situation for spillover for all the labor that lives and works in the tea plantations they are in high contact with these species so that's the other thing that you know many times the people who might be in contact 
uh, with wild animals may not be in a position to really i mean they may just get some fever or they may not know what it is they may just ignore it right so understanding these interfaces between humans and wildlife is very important i think going forward and this is work which has been published if you're interested you can take a look it's the first first work on uh, reservoirs of bartonella uh, in the country so just to summarize then india is an important place to study emerging infectious diseases we are lucky we have not had many spillover events we've had some spillover of an spillover of nipa uh, kasanur forest disease and actually interestingly not anything very well known uh, in in the northeast but for example the northeast is very similar to south china where there have been many spillover events uh, there is some evidence of uh some very interesting interfaces in nagaland and these landscape matrices where you have these different types of habitats in the western ghats uh, definitely could be places for zoonotic spillover uh, and so overall understanding this dynamics is very important so don't think this is only about going catching some bat catching some rat and seeing what is the virus or the bacteria no it's about understanding the dynamics because even bats all the time of the year they don't harbor or shed viruses there's some points in time where they shed viruses and so understanding the dynamics how these populations are going over time is is really important i'll just conclude by sto- telling a story of india so india has a very interesting past it was an island which floated uh, breaking off from africa through the ocean and banged against asia uh, you know about 40 or 50 million years ago uh, coming into this final position about uh, 10 million years ago and because of this we have a very interesting set of species uh, and this is why the biogeography or which species live where in india is is very interesting we've shown for example that um, the species richness or the diversity of species in mammals is very concentrated in specific locations for example the northeast has a very high diversity or number of species and basically uh, because india was an island most of the species in india have come from outside they've come from the west they've come from the east or they've come from the north okay and so when you look at species some species they have a high concentration in the east other species have a high concentration in the west and some species have a high concentration in the north the endemic ones or the different ones or the unique ones have a high concentration in the south because just from a geometric perspective that is the farthest location from these waves of immigrants who are zooming in from the west north and east so this was really fascinating to discover this very simple simple patterns but uh, somehow going along very well with our understanding of the past we also did some work uh, in the western ghats uh, where we looked at birds and we showed that the shape of this that this is a cross section of the mountain range the shape of the mountain range drives speciation in birds and if you were to predict where are the two most different individuals of any bird species they would be across the palghat gap which is a big deep valley uh, in the western ghats so basically if i just look at this shape i can tell you about where the distinct species will be in this mountain range and this work has been followed up with many other species like frogs and monkeys and so on and the patterns hold the palghat gap is a biogeographic divide which means that on either side of this the species are almost always distinct so basically to summarize uh, work on biogeography uh, we can use genetic data and field sampling to better understand the origins of indian biodiversity um, overall uh, population genomic analyses helps us to understand endangered species and the impacts of humans on them an emerging infectious disease um, is an additional con- consequence of human impacts uh, and we've just begun to understand 
the drivers and the correlates here. So I'm very lucky uh, to be uh, funded by many, many, many people. Uh, all of our work requires extensive permissions, um, regulatory clearances, uh, and so on. And uh, I have to say, extensive support uh, from uh, in the in terms of like uh, this is risky work. This is difficult work. So support from a lot of people uh, in terms of uh, you know agreeing with us to go ahead with such work. <coughs> so, <coughs> like I said, I'm extremely grateful to lots of people, funding sources, institutions, um, and individuals. And I will uh, stop here. I don't know whether I went too fast. I think I did OK. Um, and I'm happy to take um, any questions if there are. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramakrishnan, for this exciting and really uh, interesting lecture. I learned uh, quite a few new things myself. Uh, now uh, we are open to uh, questions. We have some time for a few questions. So uh, anybody who wants a question can directly uh, you know, uh, put on the microphone and you can ask. Uh, myself, uh, Professor Das, now presently in Assam Downtown University. Hello. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, you see, uh, viruses are evolving, mm -hmm. as well as uh, the domesticated or the wildlife or human being. There is a, also a process of evolution. Yeah. Both of them are going together, evolving. At molecular level, do you find any competition between these two evolution? Yeah, so we have not looked at that level of depth. What we would need to do is to, for example, we are studying Mimi, right? We would uh, need to study the bats there uh, year after year after year after year. And then we could see uh, that kind of evolution. The reason we have seen this spectacular evolution in SARS-CoV-2 We've seen the variants, the new lineages, is because we have, it has infected so many people. So we've seen an explosive demographic expansion. Uh, so unless you catch a disease in that phase and really watch its evolution, it's a little tricky, but uh, definitely it's something we would love to do. And uh, hopefully this new project which we're proposing it's over three years to sample repeatedly. And if we can continue that, we should hopefully see such evolutionary trajectories. And what you're talking about is a co-evolution uh, that is even more complex uh, to, to, to see, I mean, to prove. So we would have to have uh, you know, substantial data for uh, relatively long periods of time. But that would be very exciting to investigate. In fact, uh, this emerging and re-emerging diseases, mm -hmm. zoonotic diseases, the reverse zoonosis, yeah. all these are so complicated. Yes. But till then, still then, in order to overcome these pandemics or any kind yes. of disease epidemics, yes, we have to evolve some remedial measures. Exactly. How to, how to prevent it? Is exactly. there any is there any step taken on this direction? Yeah, so I don't think yet, but the, 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 what kind of uh, I would like to do is to bring in a framework uh, which looks at hazard and risk. So hazard is the fact that many bats carry viruses. That is what makes them bats. Uh, they are able to carry many viruses. But just because you're interacting with a bat doesn't mean you have a risk of getting a disease. Like I said, there may be some times in the year where they are shedding diseases. So one way to minimize risk is to minimize interaction at specific points in time. The other way to minimize risk is if you know that bats are shedding this virus, develop a vaccine and keep it. What is the harm? Today, what has been amazing about COVID-19 is that so many uh, companies, institutions, countries developed vaccines so quickly. Right. So we can just keep it in case there's an outbreak. We can immediately use it. 
so that's yeah. that yeah. Yeah. yeah that's okay but uh, yeah. the uh, problem is something bigger than that vaccine alone cannot help in preventing any new emerging or re-emerging diseases sure. vaccine yeah. is not a solution and is the we have to try for having some biological solution <coughs> for yeah. virus emerging if sure. we can prevent somewhere <coughs> it's a very bigger uh, aspect of our uh, research work definitely yeah. some yeah. people are trying of course uh, but that's what we have to see and along with then it is to be seen whether yeah. uh, whether these uh, new viruses you see nature has got their own measure also the, yeah, yeah. Uh, viruses the plant viruses they don't affect human beings sure mostly, mostly. so yeah. that's a natural barrier somewhere they have got inherent capability mm -hmm. or the barriers yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that can we think of okay yeah so basically the thing is that we most probably zoonotic spillover is from mammals and sometimes birds because physiologically those are the taxa which are close and what you're talking about is something uh, like management so, for example, when you're talking about that Karumane example, where you have these fragmented landscapes in the tea plantation, we can look at uh, where is their highest risk of spillover, right? When this is next to this is next to that. So we can devise uh, a scenario of placement of landscapes such that this risk of spillover is minimized. So that's what I was trying to communicate about risk versus hazard. So we have to think of ways, whether it is uh, behavior, human behavior, avoid animals at some point, whether it is land management and segregation, or it is a molecular biology intervention like vaccine to minimize uh, risk of spillover. We cannot change the species which exist. So if we, we cannot wipe the world of mammals just because mammals cause spillover. No, so that cannot be. That yeah, cannot be. Exactly. That, that is uh, impossible. And that okay. if we if, if we try to do that, I yes. don't think the uh, human being will be exactly will be thriving in this world. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, okay, ma'am. There's another question from uh, Shravani Vatacharya. Uh, she's asking: Is there a relationship between climate change and zoonotic diseases? Can you highlight on that relationship? Excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, and basically, it's something which we know uh, some we know little bit about in, for example, uh, diseases caused by vectors, uh, like say transmitted by mosquitoes or something like that. Because we know that insect distributions, you know how <coughs> where they're present, <coughs> changes with increasing temperature, right? So similarly uh, with, um, say, bats and rodents, their distributions will be affected by climate change. As their distributions change, uh, so will their, um, you know, the spillover dynamics. So climate change is like an extra screw, which it is, again, we have some understanding of, okay, if the bats are here and the people are here, this is how spillover might happen. And this is going to change that whole, it will shake up the whole puzzle. Uh, so that's something which we really need to be openly looking for in the future. But thanks, that's a great question. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions? Dr. Oni, your microphone. Oh. Okay, now uh, coming to your topics, uh, this uh, some sort of comments I would like to listen from you. Using the traditional, you know, the conservative genetics or cutting at genomics, engineering, any action taken or not taken, what about the practical, legal, and ethical issues? What about what is your opinion about that? <laughs> Uh, okay, so I have not done any genetic engineering, and I I have never done, okay. and I won't, I don't okay. plan to do any genetic engineering. Uh, but yes, okay. understanding, uh, like for example, now we've understood the mutation which causes. If I speak in terms of genomics. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so basically, you know, like we we have 
whatever. We have sequenced genomes of tigers. Um, and we have like yeah. found the mutation which causes this melanistic phenotype, right? So once we publish that paper, we publish that mutation, anybody is free to make melanistic tigers using CRISPR. I'm not doing it, but somebody else can. Uh, that's an ethical issue. But um, okay. the other issue is, for example, in India, we cannot patent anything which is found in nature. So even though I have discovered this melanistic mutation, it is not an innovation of mine. It is an innovation of nature. So I cannot patent that information. And the information has to be made freely available. So uh, yeah, I mean, the information is there. And information can be misused or used constructively. Uh, that is something which we always run a risk when we make information available. Uh, the conservative uh, effect on stability in you know, a conservation of to some extent uh, the sustainability or the conservation or the restoration of mass extinction. What is your opinion on that? So restoration is a very, very important thing. Uh, basically, the idea is that there's been a lot of habitat loss. And especially in countries like India, uh, it's not just about... Uh, you know, we talk about things like ecosystem services, but you know, in countries like India, a lot of people depend on nature naturally for their livelihoods. So it is like if we lose habitat, it's not just that it doesn't look pretty anymore. There is a lot of people who actually okay. suffer loss of livelihoods and having restoration intact biological communities will result in water, better water, better air, pollination, simple things wood, firewood, which help people. But then it will take some time. So I personally feel that restoration is critical for India's future. As a large country with so many people, we simply cannot have everybody getting jobs. It's just not possible. Uh, and for a long time to come, many people in India will depend on nature. As nature is more degraded, they will be more stretched and very vulnerable. So restoration must be taken up on priority in a biologically, ecologically sensible way to allow people to continue to depend on each other. Thank you. Uma. Yes. Uh, I noticed that melanistic tiger, the photo you showed, the shot, like uh, in addition to its color, mm. I found it's a little bit, the build is also a little bit very very stout and kind of yeah. uh, mm -hmm. along with your these uh, color variations mm -hmm. like what other parameters in your entire genomic data you do analyze yeah do yeah analyze so the, yeah that's a wonderful question and i think it's something we'll have to study further we are looking at the zoo so the only reason we were able to figure this mutation out was because in nandan kanan zoo there was a melanistic litter which was born so in the, that kind of case we can actually you know, collaborate with the, the veterinarians and actually ask them, are there any other phenotypic effects they see? For example, there was some suggestion of uh, like weaker bones, but they broke their bones when they were cubs. Uh, and we'll have to follow up much more detail uh, on that. But in this case, it was actually easy for us with the melanistic tigers because the gene, there's a similar phenotype in cheetahs. There's a similar phenotype in cats. And the gene which had the mutation was already known. So we looked at a specific gene. Uh, we had a candidate gene-based approach, which allowed us to identify the mutation with more confidence. When we're talking about broader effects and yeah. looking across the genome, statistically, it becomes very difficult to discern uh, specific mutations uh, for specific traits. Yeah, there are going to be some interesting line of or direction of research on adaptive uh, ability or adaptive. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk. Uma. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. There's one last question from Great. Santa Mandal. Uh, she's asking the second wave of COVID-19. Is, uh, is contamination only responsible or there are some other causes for that? Well, I, I don't know whether we know for sure uh, what is the cause of the second wave. Uh, but 
theoretically we can say that circulation of uh, the virus amongst many asymptomatics crowding events and incorporation of mutations which allow immune res escape and better transmissibility of the virus all of these factors together may have resulted in the second wave which one was more important which one was first we can't say that <clears throat> but we definitely see a strong transition in the variants that is different different variants were around in different places but uh, once the second wave kicked in one particular variant which you read about in the newspapers called delta is basically taken over the whole country and now even the uk you can see that 90% of covid <coughs> 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 cases there are also now delta so it's highly transmissible at least right whether it causes more mortality or not we are not sure of course the higher mortality uh, amongst the youth was could be because of the poor i mean the lower proportion of people vaccinated so it's a lot of combination of things but it's definitely not only the variant it is behavior um, as well human behavior of uh, the spreading which has happened <clears throat> thank you so much dr ramakrishnan for the wonderful uh, lecture and really it's so ironical to think that you know to keep us human beings connected we are making more and more roads and in the process <laughs> really, this is something i never thought about that this really what reflecting on so, yeah. Thank you so much, and now I'll request uh, Nishan Gatoti to kindly uh, complete the formality piece for this uh, ending of this lecture. On behalf of Nishan Kamchal University, I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt thanks to you for making time in your busy schedule to speak to us today and share your expertise with the students and researchers of the university on the very important topic and wonderful presentation. The information you shared was very insightful and very enlightening. I wish you much continued success with growing appreciative support. Now, I'd like to thank our honorable vice chancellor, sir, chairpersons, deans, associate deans, and further research at the Faculty of Science, HODs, and faculty members, students, and researchers of the university for your time, participation, and previous Thank you. Uh, we hope, uh, we hope, uh, Uma, during your next uh, visit to Assam, we'll get a uh, your physical visit and physical lecture uh, in the university campus. Yeah, I would love to. I'll let you know when I'm coming next. Please, thank you. Yeah, thank you. please. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. This, this is the university. They have a beautiful campus. Please okay. Come. Yeah, nice look forward to, to that. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Okay.